No, I want to continue a theme we started in the previous couple of sessions, talking about spiritual warfare, in particular as we approach the end of the age. The, the Bible gives us some unique characteristics. Spiritual conflict and spiritual warfare are the story of Scripture. But as we approach the end of the age, Jesus and some of, uh, other text give us some rather unique insight into what we can anticipate and what we can expect so that we can be prepared. And I want to continue that. We've been working really on trying to build a foundation of some uh, principles and some perspectives that enable us to have the conversation. Deception is one of the characteristics that's increasing dramatically in our world. Um, it's becoming institutionalized and we, we, we see with that coming as the, as the limiting of free speech. And it's, it's more important, I believe, than it's ever been that we know the scripture and that we understand what God is doing in the earth so we can understand something of our place in that. So that's our target. In this session, I want to talk specifically about peace and conflict. I believe they can go together. I don't believe they're mutually exclusive. It'll require you to, to think a bit about definitions, which is where I want to start. I, I put a definition in your notes, and it's just a definition from the English dictionary. It's not about original languages, but it says the noun peace is defined in multiple ways. One, perhaps the most frequent definition, is a state of tranquility or quiet. But that's not the only definition. And I don't believe it's the way it's used, particularly in the New Testament. A second definition is a state of security. So that when Jesus said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, Jesus didn't lead a life that was tranquil or quiet. That was, so I don't imagine that he was saying he was giving us to that because he hadn't demonstrated that. Most places he went, there, there was some turmoil. He was rejected frequently. He was ultimately tortured to death. So for him to say, you can have my peace, there's not a great deal of comfort in that if you think of it as tranquility. But if you understand it as a state of security, you never find Jesus anxious. He's not anxious about food. He can feed a multitude with a little boy's happy meal. He's not anxious about storms. He can speak to the wind and the waves. He's not anxious about disease. He can raise the dead back to life again. He's not anxious about politicians who are threatening him with evil because he says, the only authority you have, my father's invested in you. You don't ever find Jesus anxious. So when he said, my peace I give to you, I want to establish a baseline. I believe we can lead lives that are defined by a sense of security, no matter what turmoil is taking place in our world. Now, that's a very important principle. Because if we imagine that our security is coming from our retirement investments or our contact list or a government or a politician or a political party, we are subject to a great deal of anxiety. But if we understand all of those things could be in flux, all of those things could be in play, and we could still understand we are secure because the creator of heaven and earth is watching over us. Amen. That our names are recorded in heaven, that he knows the hairs on our head. God said he attends the funerals of the sparrows. And we're much more valuable than they. So I want to plant the seed that, that peace security in the midst of a world of conflict is very much a possibility. Because we're going to need that peace in order to occupy the role and the place God has called us to, in my opinion. And I want to start in this, this first section. I really emerged in my heart out of our Bible reading. We've been reading, concluding David and his life and the transition between he and to Solomon, and his son, and then there's some really beautiful language in that. A New Testament passage from Acts 13, it's always struck me. It, it's a statement made about King David in the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, after removing Saul, God made David king. And he testified concerning David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He'll do everything I want him to do. I, I can hardly think of a better epitaph. Can you imagine having it written in scripture with your name? God said, you just do whatever I ask him to do. Whatever God asks you to do, he's, he'll go on record and say, you're in. I'm more concerned he could say about Alan that everything I ask him to do, he at least took it under advisement. <laughs> or he asked 50 friends. Or he's something. But about David, it says he would do just everything I wanted him to do. 
And then there's a statement, there's a, there's a song attributed to David. It says, when God had given him victory over all of his enemies. And in the midst of that song, there was a statement that captured my attention. And he's asking some rhetorical questions. The answers are obvious. Is not my house right with God? Yes. And has he not made me, made with me an everlasting covenant arranged and secured in every part? I thought, what, I mean, this is the, David's testimony at the end of his life or very near the end of his life. He said, God has made an everlasting covenant with me, arranged and secured in every part. Wow. I wonder if you could believe that about yourself, that God has a covenant with you that's arranged and secure in every part. You'll have to meditate on that a little bit. You have to think about it. You even have to rearrange some priorities because a lot of times we're a little torqued with God because he's not doing what we want him to do. Or we don't like his timeline or his schedule or, you know, there's something. We're very seldom content. There's usually some way we want the world to be that it's not or the people in our world to be that they're not. And when we're giving God grief about it or we're, sulk, we're, we're withdrawn from God or something. And David said that God had made a covenant arranged and secured in every part. And there's one more piece of David, and it really fits into this conflict discussion, warfare discussion. David is a warrior. I mean, from the time we meet him, he's a shepherd boy and he's killing lions and bears and he pretty soon moves on to Philistine giants that terrify the entire Israelite army. I mean, above all else, his story is one of a warrior. And when it, when it comes to the end of his life and they're celebrating him in, in scripture, one of the ways he's celebrated is there's almost an entire chapter that is committed to reciting the mighty men who served with David. And I, I, thought, as I, I read it and I, I kept thinking about it. I thought, that's a little unique. His epitaph, he's, he's remembered because of the exploits of the mighty warriors that stood with him. I mean, no, he wasn't just a man of war himself. The, the mightiest of men stood with him and they are listed by name. I put just a sampling in your notes because I can't read all their names. I'd have to make them up. But it said, these are the names of David's mighty men. There's nothing quite like this list in scripture. We have genealogies, that's a part of scripture. We have listing of tribal leaders. We have all sorts of lists, but I don't know that there's really a comparable list to a group of warriors that stood with the most celebrated of all of Israel's kings. These are the names of his mighty men. Somebody. <laughs> From somewhere. And he was the chief of the three. And he raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. That's a bad man. <laughs> one on 800, that's about fair. And he is the chief of David's mighty men. And he goes on to list them all by name. I just put one more in your notes because he, his story stands out to me. Benaiah was a valiant fighter from Kabzeel. That just sounds like Benaiah, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel. Sounds like Hollywood made that up, doesn't it? He's got a headband and an eye patch. I don't know. He performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed the lion. So we know a little something about him. He's about half crazy. <laughs> right? I like a snowfall too. A good snowy day is kind of fun. Maybe, you know, the work day is going to be a little shortened or something. But, you know, he has a snowy day and he sees a pit with a lion in it. And his decision, I think I'll go down there. I might go past there. I might take a picture of that. I might tell my friends. But he decides to climb down in the pit. Could we agree he's not quite right? <laughs> he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went against him with the club again. 
You've got a spear. I think I'll take a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah. He too was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. There's no question that the presentation of scripture brings an inordinate focus to David as a warrior. And the commentary that we're giving on him on the New Testament is God said, I have found a man after my own heart. He'll do whatever I ask him. There's not a rebuke in that. There's not a complaint in that. I understand David wasn't allowed to build the temple, but David was allowed to put the plan together for the temple and to gather all the resources for the temple and to commission the construction of the temple and tell his son, this is what you need and here it is and do it this way. So when we talk about spiritual warfare, uh, the, the heroes that we know in scripture did not lead their lives of faith apart from conflict wrapped in a blanket of peace. They may have had a sense of security that came from their relationship with God. If God delivered a lion into my hands and a bear into my hands, who is Goliath? Well, Goliath was somebody that scared the entire Israelite army. God's anointed me to be king, but we already have a king and he wants to kill me. That's an awkward place. And yet David was secure in the fact that God had anointed him to be king. I would submit to you that one of the things that we can grow in is our security in the Lord. Not an arrogance, not a pride. I'm not talking about that. We have taken our security from other things. We've imagined we couldn't be deceived because we belong to the right church or we belong to the right denomination or we read books from the right publishing house or we've had the right translation of the Bible. Folks, all of those things are subject to disappointment. Our security does not come from temporary places. And so as you're, as you're reading through the Kings, I think the reflection on David and his life is helpful. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.